Hello guys, welcome back to our channel and welcome back for another lecture in the subject matter Law Enforcement Operation and Planning with Crime Mapping So uh, for today's lecture, we will be talking about the uh, PNP Operational Procedure uh, I guess this is already the part 4 of the uh, series of the lecture that we have relative to this subject and uh, if you haven't watched our discussion with regards to the previous lecture, uh, you can visit the uh, description below. I will be including the playlist of all the lectures that we had so far relative to this subject matter. So uh, for today's lecture, we are already on the Rule 10. Rule 10 of the PNP Operational Manual. And uh, our topic for today will be regarding spot checks slash accosting and uh, pat down searches so uh, we all know that uh, a police officer is not allowed to uh, conduct search unless the police officer is equipped with search warrant this is protected under our philippine constitution that we are entitled not to be searched as citizen of this country if uh, there is no valid search warrant. In uh, today's lecture, we will be discussing the instances wherein a police officer may conduct search and uh, spot check without the benefit of a search warrant. Okay, so uh, before we proceed to that, it is noted on the PNP operational manual that, that in the conduct of uh, pat-down search and the spot check, the uh, constitutional rights of each and every individual shall always be respected. So this procedure shall be conducted only if there is a valid, convincing, and rational justification present that such operation or needs to be conducted. This is, of course, to protect also the constitutional rights of each and every individuals that uh, you know there might be some instances where a police officer will stop you for for no reason and uh, will uh, be conducting some you know spot check or some uh, sort of body search without the benefit of a search warrant as a civilian the civilian may invoke their constitutional rights relative to this and of course for the law enforcer to be able to push through with the conduct of this operation or procedure, they must justify or provide justification, valid justification that uh, what they are going to conduct would, uh, would fall on to legal searches and would fall upon the Rule 10 of the PNP Operational Manual. So uh, for today's lecture, we will be talking about the instances we're in the act of conducting spot checks and pat down searches is valid. So what are the circumstances that this procedure is allowed to be conducted? On my uh, presentation, I have there the uh, at least eight circumstances wherein spot check and search is allowed to be conducted. You know, when we talk about spot search and check, these are only some sort of routinary activity for police officer while they are conducting uh, patrol operations and uh, similar operations. They are allowed to stop an individual and uh, inquire some or require some information from that individual if the situation or circumstances falls on the eight circumstances that I'm going to be discussing okay so let's talk about the first instance uh, we have here the first instance it states there that the appearance or demeanor of the individual suggests that he is a part of a criminal enterprise or that person is engaged in criminal acts these first circumstances where a spot check and search may be allowed to be conducted is we can say that it is very controversial. In my previous lecture, I uh, stated that it is really hard for the criminology profession to assign a specific appearance 
or a specific way of behaving to criminals. I mentioned there that uh, we should already get out on the instances wherein we are judging individuals based on their appearance. But uh, we have here part of the PNP procedure that states there that if the person is you know, suspicious by his appearance and by, by his demeanor, a police officer may stop that person and inquire some information or conduct body search. So uh, I mentioned that this is very controversial because uh, when these circumstances will be presented in court, they, they always question on what specific basis did the action of the police officer can be justified. Whether his judgment on, on that certain person is indeed valid. So if there is no apparent reason to justify that the suspicion of the, uh, of the law enforcer is indeed valid, they will just dismiss the case, claiming that the conduct of search is indeed invalid. So in what instances the police officer may justify their action of stopping someone requesting information, conducting body search, be allowed. If, if we are familiar with regards to instances wherein a wanted poster is being distributed to the different uh, police station, that, that can be one of, of the instances wherein they may stop a certain person if that person appears on their wanted list. So if, if the uh, law enforcer, while conducting his patrol, happens to come into close contact with someone who is listed as a wanted person, that can be one of the instances wherein, based on the physical appearance of that person, the police officer may justify his action of stopping that person, asking information about, uh, about his about his identity, maybe requesting some uh, identification to be shown, just to make sure that that person is not or is the person who is appearing onto the wanted list. So that is just one of the circumstances that I can think of that a police officer may be allowed to stop a person, request for identification, request for information based on the physical appearance of a certain person. But if it does not fall onto that circumstances, wherein the person who was stopped and searched was just, you know, uh, a regular person who does not appear on the wanted list, however, he looks like he is up to no good. His appearance says that he may be, you know, very malnourished. That, that is why he looks like he's using drugs or he... He is uh, he's tampered with a lot of uh, body tattoos and so on. I think if, if the police officer will stop the person by, by those reasons alone, uh, I guess that that would not be considered as, as a valid reason for stopping a person because that is no longer rational onto the part of uh, being humane. Because, we, I don't know, we, we can say that that is already very... Um, judgmental. So maybe another example that I can think of where these first circumstances may fall into is, like for example, uh, you know, I have nothing against the uh, tattoo, tattooing. I have nothing against this tradition or this, uh, this form of expression because I do believe that it's, it's the freedom of this individual to, to have or have not a uh, tattoo on their body. However, if their tattoo shows their membership to a certain criminal organization, because there are some criminal organization who use tattooing as, as part of their identity, to which if this tattoo is seen into the body of someone, we can conclude, or the law enforcer can conclude that he is indeed a member of the criminal organization. So at that instance, you may stop as a police officer. You are just in a position 
to inquire about the identity of that person and maybe conduct some search if it would be uh, allowed. Because based on his physical appearance, the presence of a tattoo that is linked into a criminal organization, you may conclude that he is indeed a member of the criminal organization. So I think that's justifiable enough to stop a person and inquire about his identity and activities. There are some other instances where in rebel groups are proudly wearing their uh, uniforms in public. That is also one of the circumstances where you may stop them because, you know, they are, they are members of the rebel group. And uh, rebellion is the continuing crime. So whenever they go, as long as you can identify that they are wearing something that signifies that they are a member of a rebel organization, then as a police officer, you may stop them and make some body search inquire about their identity, and so on. So those are the circumstances that I can think of on the, on the situation number one provided by the PNP Rules on Operation Rule, rule 10. Okay? Let's proceed to the next circumstances wherein it says there that if the action of that individual suggests that he is engaged in criminal activities and similar illegal activities. So there are circumstances wherein we can identify or based on how the individual acts, he is very suspicious. Let's say that this person is, uh, is, is running away from someone who is allegedly being a victim of snatching, hold up, and so on and you happen to be in that area, and you see someone who is running away. So uh, you may be able to justify your action if you're going to stop that person and conduct some search on that person based on how the person behaved during that time. So I think that's one of the circumstances that we can relate to circumstances number two. Or maybe while conducting a patrol, you came across a person who has, you know, uh, suspicious looking eyes and it happens that uh, there are some evidence that signifies that he was engaged in criminality. Like, for example, he wears a bloody shirt or he is carrying a knife with, with the blood or he may be carrying a firearm. Who knows? Then you came across this person. So you all have the rights as a police officer to stop that person and inquire about the things that you had observed upon, upon him. So that's one also under circumstances number two. Now let's proceed to number three. The number three talks about if the person is in an area which is questionable, wherein his presence there is very questionable, then you may inquire upon that person. Let's say it's already in the middle of the night, then a person was, you know, sitting in front of the business establishment alone, or he is in a parked vehicle in the middle of the night, wherein he is in uh, front of uh, a business establishment again. You may question the person in, in that circumstances, inquiring about his alibi on his or her presence in that area at that specific time. So uh, there are other circumstances also that this, uh, this situation we have here, situation number three, may, may be used in justifying the conduct of spot check and search. Okay, uh, okay we have here number four, if the person is carrying some suspicious object. Okay, so... A lot of object may be considered as suspicious, such as, for example, that's a drug concealed into some items. If that's a firearm concealed into, into his body or into his other objects that he is carrying. So if you have reasonable suspicion that the person is maybe carrying some illegal contraband, you can justify your action of stopping that person inquiring about his identity, and maybe conducting search, even without the benefit of a search warrant.
Situation number five we have here, if the suspect's clothing bulge in a manner that he is carrying some firearm or weapon, then by all means, you have all the rights to stop and search that person. So if it happens that uh, while conducting a patrol, you came across a person who seems like been carrying a firearm on his hips or any type of weapon, that is concealed in inside his clothing. If uh, you believe that indeed what is bulging into that suspect's clothing is indeed a weapon or a deadly weapon, then you have all the rights to stop and search that person. The uh, six circumstances is where the suspect has been found in an area wherein a crime was allegedly committed. So you have all the rights to question all the individuals who happens to be present in that area to determine their possible involvement on the crime that was committed. So you're going to establish whose alibi is indeed uh, true and whose alibi is false. So with that, you can be able to figure out uh, who committed the crime if it happens that the person who committed the crime is still in that area. So your first suspect should be those individuals who are present in that area where a crime is allegedly committed. So it's just valid to question or maybe search those individuals who happen to be present in that area when the crime was committed. Okay, situation number seven is when the police officer had the prior knowledge already with regards to the criminal record of that person and he happens to come across this person. So, would that be valid reason already to stop and search the person? No. So, what circumstances this situation number seven may be applied? If it happens that there is a crime allegedly committed in that area, and it happens that in that area, this person whom you know to have been involved into certain crimes in his past is also present in that area, then... That is the time that you are justified to stop, search, stop, and maybe conduct some interview upon that person. But if you're just walking, conducting patrol, and you happen to come across this person who had already been released in prison, but since you know him to have uh, criminal records in the past, then you stop that person and maybe conduct some search, I think that would not be justified because... Uh, apparently, you are judging that person based on uh, his past criminal records. So that can be applied only if it happens that that person is nearby the place where the crime was committed and you, you happen to came across that person and there is a crime that was committed. So it's just okay that maybe you would, you would ask the person, uh, maybe for, for an information, not really for, for his involvement or so on. But you just ask regular question like, uh, where are you when, this, when the crime was committed? What are you doing when the crime was committed? Uh, determine his alibi at the time because there is a probability that maybe he is involved into that crime because his presence or near the area where the crime was actually or allegedly been committed. But if there is no circumstances like that, and it is just a regular day, nothing unfortunate incident happened, so you can just stop search the person because of his past criminal record, because that would be part of the institutional labeling that we are studying under the criminology profession. Okay, so let's proceed to circumstances number eight, wherein if the person flees at the sight of a police officer. So you have a reason to go after that person and if you had already captured, I don't know if that's the proper term, if you have already captured that person, you may uh, inquire about the reason why did he flee. Because, you know, you know it's just, uh, I can say that it's part of common sense that if a person is afraid of the law enforcer, his initial response is to run away from police officer. Then probably he is trying to 
hiding something. He don't want to be near the police officer. So maybe there are some also valid reason why this happens because probably they had traumatic experience with the uh, police officer. That is why they're afraid. And second circumstances that would explain probably the action of the person of running away from police officer is when he had committed something wrong. So that is how I see this action coming from ordinary individual. But as a police officer, you must have a suspicion already that the person had committed a crime since he, he is running away from police officer. Like, like in cases where there is a checkpoint. So if there is a checkpoint, instead of stopping, the person just went on his way and uh, he accelerated and went on his way. So that's, that is already suspicious on the part of the law enforcer, which gives them the right to go after that person, apprehend or capture that person for further inquiry. Okay? So if they committed the crime, if they can be able to establish that they committed the crime, then they have all the rights to arrest the person. But uh, I believe that uh, running away from a police checkpoint is already a crime. So they have all the rights already to stop, arrest, and search that person because of their action. Okay? So uh, those are the instances we're in. Spot check and search may be conducted. You know, this is just regular questioning and interview. Uh, and also, if the person allows to be searched, then they may be searched. Even if the circumstances is already valid to conduct spot check, search is not an automatic part of it. You know, even if the circumstances makes it valid to conduct spot check, it does not mean that the law enforcer is already allowed to make or conduct some search. You must remember that still, all of the search that they will be conducting shall still fall under the plain view doctrine. So they are not allowed to search objects or anything that is no longer visible in plain view. So they need search warrant or the permission of the person who would be searched for them to do that okay so let's proceed to our next topic which is the ground for body frisk and pat down search so there's a difference be between spot check and search since it, it, it usually does not involve physical contact a police officer may stop a person and question him require some identifications and other relevant information to a person without conducting body search. There is also a different guidelines with regards to the conduct of body search and pat-down search. I hope I explained the difference between them clear to everyone. So when we talk about spot search and check, this is just a regular questioning. It doesn't involve physical search and so on. There is a separate guidelines in the conduct of body search and pat-down search. So when the uh, spot check is already valid, you establish that your action as a police officer of stopping that person and questioning that person is already established and valid, then that is the only time that you're going to look for justification again, another justification in order for you to proceed in the conduct of body frisk or pat-down search. Spot check and search does not involve physical contact. It's just a regular questioning. Next part of that, after the conduct of you know regular questioning, is pat-down search or body frisk. Only if they fall upon the following circumstances. Okay? What are those circumstances we have here? Number one, if you have a reasonable suspicion that the person had committed a crime and that crime involved violence or anything that would endanger the life of others or life of the police officer and uh, it involves, you know, deadly weapon and so on. So if you have reasonable belief that indeed a crime was committed and that person had committed the crime, you may 
conduct a body search on that person without the benefit of search warrant and that would be valid so you need to justify why the conduct of search body search is valid for the court to appreciate all the evidence that you will be presenting inside the court another circumstances is when the police officer handles a lot of suspects so you know if you have a lot of suspect in that area in that specific case and you happen to came across them stop them conduct an inquiry upon them verbal inquiry upon them and there are too many so it's just um, proper to first make sure that these persons to whom you are uh, conducting regular inquiry has no deadly weapon in their possession because that will endanger the life of uh, the civilian present in the area and as well the life of the police officer who is conducting spot search and checks. So if it happens that we have a lot of suspect together, held together, uh, you might want to you might want to conduct first a body search upon them to make sure that they are not possessing any deadly weapon, which may put the life of the police officer as well as the society in danger okay so also in the conduct of pat down search and body freeze uh, take into consideration the time the location of the area before you conduct this uh, operation so before you proceed with the other part of the operation because of if it happens that the person to whom uh, you came across to is an area where you know crime regularly being committed or they are in an area which are infested by criminals or you know rebels and other types of enemy that will endanger the life of the police officer before you you proceed talking to them as long as it's justifiable please make sure that they are not possessing any deadly weapon or firearm within their body so there is a necessity for you to conduct pat down search or body freeze before proceeding to other uh, operation so that's the thing and also another circumstances that may justify the conduct of pat down search is that when uh, the police officer have prior knowledge with regards to the behavior of the person with regards to his records that he often carry firearm with him you know if if you happen to came across a person if you happen to be interviewing a person who has propensity to carry deadly weapon, then uh, make sure that he is not carrying one when you are uh, dealing with that person. So if you have those circumstances in mind, then it's just proper and necessary, justifiable to conduct body search or uh, pat down search to that person first. If the appearance and demeanor of the suspect indicates that he is involved in crime or if he is a member of a criminal organization then okay it's a go signal that you must conduct body freeze or pat down search as i have stated on the previous lecture that we have if it happens that the person appears on your wanted list then of course you may uh, stop the person do a body search, identify that person, and make sure that no one, no life will be put into danger. Because who knows? If your suspicion is right, then uh, some life may be put into danger. What if he is wearing some, you know, you, you're the uniform that can be identified as the uniform of the rebel groups, and you, ha and, and you happen to came across that person? So... Uh, before proceeding into the conduct of identifying the person or inquiring about his uh, identity, make sure that he is not he is not carrying some deadly weapon. Okay, so you are allowed to conduct body search and pat down search to that person in that circumstances. Okay, next is we have here if there is a visual indication suggesting that the person is carrying a firearm 
or other deadly weapon, then you may proceed to the conduct of pat-down search. Okay? So, uh, whenever pat-down search will be conducted, take into consideration that all or every search that will be conducted shall be performed by the same gender. So, if the suspect is a woman, the search, pat-down search, shall be conducted also by a police woman. So, it goes to the gender. Okay? That is, of course, to avoid any unnecessary or any unwanted advance the both sides may take in the conduct of the search. Okay? So uh, that is with regards to body frisk and pat-down search. Okay? Well, let's proceed to the procedures and guidelines in conducting those things. Although we had discussed already some of the guidelines that must be followed, but there's also other part of uh, the procedures and guidelines that have not mentioned yet in this lecture. So let's talk about them one by one. So with regards to spot check and search, we have here number one. When approaching an individual, the uh, police officer must identify himself as a police officer in case he is not wearing uniform. And uh, when we talk about identify, it's not just verbally, but as a, uh, the police officer is also obliged to present some identification or a badge to the person to whom search or inquiry will be conducted. So... Uh, for me, as, uh, as a civilian, if somebody would come to me and ask me some information about anything, I would, I would rather leave than providing information. Unless they will identify themselves as a member of the law enforcement organization that may be, then that's the time that as a civilian, I am obliged to answer their inquiries. But if they are not identifying themselves as a member of the law enforcement organization, nor have they presented any identification that indeed proves that they are a member of the organization, then I guess I don't have the obligation to answer. So that is with regards to that thing. So as a police officer, it is not just enough to identify yourself verbally, but you must also present some identification, especially today that we have a lot of uh, individuals who pretends to be a member of the law enforcer, law enforcement, just to take advantage on the benefit of becoming one, or maybe just to extort some money and so on. So a police officer is obliged to identify himself before questioning or before conducting search, and uh, by saying identify, he must present evidence also that he is a member of the organization. It's just not firearm, because there are instances where they will be identifying themselves as a member of the law enforcement organization by just showing their firearm, which is improper. The firearm does not prove that you are indeed a member of the PNP organization. What proves it is, of course, we have here the badge and we have the identification card. Okay? So uh, that is with regards to the first part. Second is we have here a police officer must be courteous all the time. You know, if you are already a member of the organization, you must be courteous in dealing with the members of the society. Because uh, you are definitely the one who would be asking favor to provide or give information to them. So uh, regardless of who they are, who the person are, a police officer is required to be courteous all the time in dealing with them. And also, take into consideration that by, by being courteous, you are not jeopardizing also your safety. So, While being courteous to the person, you must also remain vigilant because who knows, if you are not yet familiar with who, whom you are dealing with and what type of environment you are dealing with, so something bad might happen. So you must always remain vigilant and courteous. Okay? So we have here the letter C. 
So uh, there are instances also that when a police officer will be dealing with the groups of individuals suspected to have been committed a crime, you know, it's just proper to, to use uh, discretion on, on to, in dealing with this matter because uh, if you think you will be needing backup before before you're going to be de- uh, before you're going to deal with this individual then you must request for backup and uh, if you think that it's necessary for you to wait for your backup before approaching them or before uh, dealing with them then it's up to you because you know your own safety like for example if there there is a police report that there is some group of individuals who are allegedly uh, doing some pot session in an area so you came uh, you reported or you responded onto that call and it happens that there is indeed a group of individuals uh, doing some something in that area if uh, because police officer usually works in body system are usually a group of two so if you think that you cannot uh, deal with them since they outnumbered you then call for backup and uh, if you think that they are armed or it's dangerous for you to deal with them yet without the backup then it's your own discretion so as a police officer take those things into consideration also for uh, letter C, we have here the still part of the procedure and guidelines with regards to the conduct of spot checks and search. Uh, what are the questions that are allowed to be asked during the conduct of search to a person uh, you spotted in in the public to whom you you believe to have to whom you have a suspicion that. He probably is engaged into criminality. So uh, those quest- questions shall be limited to the following. In regards to his identity, as I've stated before, identity. So not just by words, but also please require some identification cards or anything that will uh, establish his identity. Because if uh, somebody would ask me my name, my identity, without asking me to present some identification card, I can just make up some names. So uh, you look for evidence also. Identification cards is the best. And we have also the place of residence and other information that may be relative to uh, what you wanted to prove or to prove. Okay. As a rule, uh, you cannot hold the person for a longer period than necessary because that is already a crime based on our uh, criminal law. So holding them longer than necessary time, that is already a crime. So if you want to conduct furthermore inquiry, then make it very short. So as long as you establish already their identity and there is no longer need for them to be, to be detained continuously, then definitely let them go. Because detaining them with no warrant of arrest or with no legal justification is a crime. So do not detain a person up after questioning longer than what it is needed. Okay? At this point where search or spot search or check is being conducted, there is no need yet to inform them of their Miranda rights. So when we talk about the Miranda rights, Uh, I will be covering that in a separate lecture. But just to have an idea with regards to Miranda rights, these are the rights that the police officer shall inform the subject of an arrest before arresting that person. Like, for example, uh, the right to remain silent, the right to have an attorney, the right to know all his constitutional rights and uh, different types of rights provided under the Constitution and under the laws, those are some of the Miranda rights, which are a requirement for an arrest to be valid. So why did I say, or why, why did they say that it's not yet needed? Because basically, you're not yet arresting the person. You're just asking or 
you are just doing some regular interview or questioning to that person without detaining them or without without restricting their rights okay so uh, it's not yet a requirement to inform them of their miranda rights as well as their rights against any sort of torture okay but when you all are already arresting them then it's just proper to inform them of their miranda rights okay so uh, that ends our lecture with regards to the procedures and guideline for spot check and search. Now let's proceed to the next topic, which is procedures and guidelines for body freeze and pat-down search. So when conducting pat-down search or body freeze, do not conduct it if you're alone because uh, you, your life will be put into danger. So when conducting a pat-down search or body freeze, it is advisable that you conduct it with two of you. Since uh, while you are conducting search, you are already exposed to a lot of danger. If it happens that the person has comrade present in that area, then you will be put into danger. So while you are doing some searching to, to the body of, of the person who, whom you believe to have committed a crime, it is necessary that someone should back you up and watch behind your back in case someone will attack you or some, someone will attack you from behind. So when doing pat-down search, it is advisable to do it with, with your body. So when conducting a pat-down search, it, must, uh, it is advisable to conduct it uh, in a standing position. So regularly it is conducted by, by uh, requiring the person to, to face face uh, stationary object usually if there is a wall present in that area then let him face the wall hands on the wall uh, face the wall and you're going to search from uh, from from his from his back so that's the regular procedure uh, there are instances wherein if you think that the person is you know aggressive if the person seems uh, and cooperative and uh, he is dangerous then that's the time that you may conduct the pat down search with him on the floor or uh, lying down on the floor and so on. so uh, the position on how you're going to conduct the uh, search pat down search depends upon the circumstances that are present already in in the situation so if he is a dangerous person, you believe that he is a dangerous person. So you must take precaution and conduct the search while uh, he is lying down, face down the, the ground while you are conducting the search. But if he is not a dangerous person, you believe that uh, you can overpower that person, that uh, he is cooperating, then I think it's, there is no need for him to be pinned down onto the ground. Uh, just a regular, you know, search. Let him face a stationary object and you conduct the search from uh, his back. So in the conduct of pat-down search, as I've stated on the previous slides, in the conduct of pat-down search, it is only limited to plain view. So any object, that is not visible with, with the naked eye or with your five senses shall not be searched without search warrant. So what, in what instances can that happen? So let's say, for example, that the person is carrying him with him a handbag. So he is carrying a handbag or a touch case or a box or anything. So clearly that the the content of, of that box, of, of that bag, or of that attache case is outside the uh, plain view doctrine. So you, you cannot open. You, you are not allowed to open those box unless, number one, he had committed a crime. Number two, you have search warrant. So if you don't have those two circumstances, don't open this object. So if you worry that maybe the firearm is in that bag, in that box, then what you can do is to remove that object from the reach of the person while doing search. Because you cannot open that box unless 
the two circumstances that I mentioned is present. Or, number three, the person voluntarily open. The person who is being searched voluntarily open the bag, the, the object for you to search the content. So those are just the circumstances. If it does not fall to those circumstances, then do not open anything. It is limited only to what your eyes can see, what your nose can smell, what your skin can feel, and, you know, the five senses. So that's plain view. Okay, so I guess letter D was already tackled. If in the conduct, since we're talking about plain view, if by doing some search, by, by touching the pocket, the clothing of the person, you came across an object to which you believe uh, a firearm or some some weapon, then that is part of the plain view. You can you can uh, if it happens that in his pocket you you touch something that you believe to to be something to be a contraband, then you can uh, require the person to take that away from from his pocket. So that's part of the plain view. However, if uh, the search is already done, you already search all his item, all, all his belongings, and uh, there is nothing that was found, meaning no contraband, no illegal objects, no illegal weapons, no, no anything, no nothing, no nothing that will be justification for a valid arrest, then what you should do is, of course, to, to thank the person and let go of the person since no crime was committed okay so if there is nothing more to hold him if so if there is no more reason for him to be held any longer to be held any longer then you must let go of that person so uh, after that if uh, there is no crime committed meaning you already searched the, the belongings of that person you already searched the body of that person and you found out found nothing to to relate him or to to connect him to criminal act or to criminal activity then what you should do is as, as i've said that let him go already and after that you must make a report and submit that to the proper authority okay so uh, i guess uh, i explained already the uh, rule 10 of the pnp operational procedure so if there are questions relative to this discussion feel free to ask that's it for today see you next meeting